Hello and welcome to Virtual Career Day. My name is Dr. Gwendolyn Carter and I am a college professor. I teach a course called Anatomy and Physiology. It's just a big fancy term for anatomy, meaning what the body is made of, and physiology, how the body works. So for my career path, I graduated college and then I went to a school called a graduate school. At this school, I could have either gotten a master's degree and then gotten a doctorate degree, but I skipped the master's because the doctorate degree was free. So decided to not go with that whole having to spend money for my degree. So my doctorate degree is not the type that uses my science knowledge in order to help sick people. Mine is the type that does his research. So my specific degree is what's called a PhD. So this is a philosophical doctorate. So I get to put letters at the end of my name. So a lot of the stuff you get to do, you get to put letters at the end of your name. So that PhD, I can either be in a laboratory and do science research to help find better medicines for sick people, or how does the body work and figure out how to work with that in order to help sick people, or like I do, I teach at the college level. So my students are either high school students who are getting a head start or students that are any version of adults. So I have some that are very early 20s and some that are as old as some people's grandparents because they're just coming back to school or they're challenging themselves to take a course they've never taken before. So Let's go through what other stuff I actually teach in class. I'm gonna switch this camera around and show you some fun stuff. So this is one of the labs I have, which has computers, I have a refrigerator for storage, more cabinets for storage. And then I have lab stations that pre-COVID, I would actually have four students at each lab table and they could work together on their different assignments. I have different um, other equipment and I have a lab full of stuff. Had some, going back to this, microscopes so I can look at different stuff. And then more lab tables, more equipment. And then here we go with the fun stuff. So I'm gonna start way down here with our actual uh, textbook. So for my class, even though this is a thick textbook, it takes us all year to go through that textbook. So for my class, anatomy and physiology, so we can see the words, anatomy, what the body is made of, physiology, how the body works. So for my class, we go through the entire body. So starting with the head, the brain, we look at the eyeball function and all of our senses. We also do the kind of more normal stuff you know about. So the heart and the lungs and looking at all of your digestive system organs like your liver and gallbladder, there's your stomach, these are your intestines, so your small and your large intestines. The kidneys are in the back, but um, if I took this down, I'd have all kinds of organs falling. So let's keep them all in place for right now. So for my course, since we're dealing with humans, having a human body to study is very expensive. So instead of using humans, we use animals to study them. So we don't actually uh, get the animals themselves. We actually use animals that were used for another purpose and we get the other kind of leftover bits. So the way that we're able to look at animals to study human parts is because we have some similar parts. So here I'm looking at a human skull and the skull of a horse. So looking at some of the parts that we share that are similar, we have eye socket where your eyeball goes, eye socket for the horse. We have other similar bone structures, like here we can see this bridge, and it's the same place for the horse. So we have similar structures, got an upper jaw where we're holding our teeth, same thing, similar structures where we can see the same things on the human that we can see on an animal. So we're able to compare them and look at the parts. So here's another example where we have the upper thigh or leg bone for a human and the same thing for a horse. Now with horses, they have really long ankles, so that's why their thigh bone's kind of short. Anyway, so for example, we have similar parts like these two knobs that help to make our ankle, not ankle, knee joint, same two knobs that are here for the horse. 
this is kind of beaten up a little bit, but that's okay. Same thing, we have similar structures where this ball region goes into our hip socket and this ball region goes into the hip socket of the horse. So looking at animals that have similar features and allow us to study the human anatomy. So for my course, we start off at the microscope level. So we look at cells and how they work, and then we look at different tissues. So I'm going to show you a slide that I've already prepared so you can see this well. Go for the dot, go for the dot, go for the dot, go, 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 there we go. Okay, so in this microscope, this is actually shifted, now I've got to refocus it. But that's okay, because that is what happens. We have to free focus when things get out of alignment. Go for that, go for that, go for that. Going this way, and perfect. Okay, let me do a little adjustments for focus. Ah, there we go. Go back, there we go. So, in this section, I am looking at, go back, go back, go back, go back, very slowly, okay, here we go. So I'm looking at a section of tissue from the scalp. So that's the skin on top of your head. So with this section, I can see a lot of different types of cells as well as different types of what's called tissue. So these cells, when they work together, they are able to create what's called a tissue. So I can look at muscle tissue, fat tissue. Wow, I'm moving a lot, wow. Okay, here we go again, one more time. There we go. So that's some fat tissue. And then I can move up and I can find an area called the dermis, which is connective tissue. So that helps to support our skin. And at the very top, that little dark band, that's the upper areas of your skin called the epidermis. And then the top part of our epidermis on our skin, almost done, is the dry, dead, multiple layers of skin cells that allow for us to protect our bodies from the outside like germs and bacteria and viruses. So in our... Uh, on our skin, we do have layers of just dead cells that's kind of sitting there. So here's this other sample view. Looking at, and I don't have to move anything with this one. Um, looking at a, let's fix this, sample of bone. So with our skeletal system, see those little black dots? Those are, are what are called bone cells. And they're actually still living in your bones right now because they monitor what's going on with the bones and then tell the other types of bone cells that are still building bones, go for the dot. There we go, there we go, uh, yep, yep, almost, there we go. They tell those other cells to build more bones. So they built, the bone is built in these circular structures called osteons, which, when I get there, so those circular structures are like layers, like onion, that build bone and makes them nice and strong. So with our tissues, we can actually put several layers of tissue together to form what's called an organ. So you already know stuff like your heart and liver, lungs, intestines, but also your muscles are also organs. So we have different organ systems, and one of them is all muscles. So if I took this shoulder muscle off of this arm, this muscle by itself, this is our deltoid sh sh shoulder muscle, so this muscle by itself is its own individual organ. The same thing with the bone. So each bone is its own individual organ. So we learn our different organ systems, how they work together. So for example, our skeletal system, how we build bone, how we take bone away, how we can damage it and heal it back together. We also do that for our muscles and how they contract so we can move, so they shorten in length so that we can actually cause movement and do stuff. Um, and then also how other stuff like your heart, liver, lungs, the big stuff, how they work together. So also in my class, we have to identify structures. So not only do they identify 
all of the bones all put together. But they have to do that also with the bones that are pulled apart. So we have different bones and where they are and note, uh, looking at all of like, for example, like the different holes, different bumps, those all have names. And so my students have to learn how to identify that. So when they're at their job, they can, um, they can label the exact piece and know the specific word or vocabulary term in order to, um, <clears throat> in order to um, write out their reports or tell what happened to their patient. So they label bones, we label different tissues, we label different organs. But one fun thing that we do, other than looking at plastic models, is that we also do dissection. So, some of the animals that we eat, the stuff that we don't use for eating, we're able to use for dissection. So, here is a cow eyeball. So, here's the front part of the eyeball there. So, we're able to eat the cow meat for hamburgers, but also your science classes can get... Uh, a eyeball and then my students will cut them up and we can identify all of the little pieces and parts inside the eyeball so we get stuff from a cow we get stuff from a sheep so this is a sheep brain that's little small brains because they just follow the herd so they don't have to think really hard so we're able to cut it up and see all of the different pieces and parts on the brain so here you can actually see a layer of protection called the meninges, which helps to protect the brain on the outside. So you should still see all the wrinkled bits when you take all off that protective layer. Another thing we see, so sheep, we have lamb chops, and then we get those brains. And then another thing we do um, in my class is we dissect pig kidneys. So this is actually how, about how large it is. So cutting it open and seeing the parts. And pig heart. So we eat the bacon, and then my class, we get their body parts. So I had to give away uh, my heart because, uh, well, the pig heart to a student because, um, yeah, they were in quarantine. They still need to do their assignments, so they needed something to do. Okay, so here is a plastic model of the heart, and we're able to cut it open and see the chambers and how they work to pump blood to the lungs and then receive that oxygenated blood, that oxygen we breathe in and then send it out to the rest of the body. So with my students, many of them are going to be going in the healthcare field as nurses and doctors and ambulance drivers and paramedics. So we also do more stuff on our actual own body. So for example, we can get a sample of your urine or your pee and put it in a little cup and then we can take these sticks which have these little colorful squares on them. And with those colorful squares, we'll dip it into our urine sample and then look at the changes that happen with the colors. So this helps us to let us know what's actually in that urine. So some stuff is supposed to be there and there's some stuff that's not supposed to be there. So we're able to detect, hey, something's wrong with your patient because there is something in their urine that's not supposed to be there. Other things we look at, we look at what's called a ECG, also used to be called an EKG. So whenever you go to a hospital and you hear that beeping noise, that beep, 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 we're actually monitoring the electrical activity in the heart. So making sure that the patient's okay. So these little spikes, they're showing where your heart is pumping blood. So looking at that activity and making sure that's normal in the patient. So other things we do with the heart, we can listen to the heart using a stethoscope. We also can look at blood pressure. So how strong is the blood flowing in the body using a fancy word, sphygmomanometer, in order to do that. Uh, the general term, easier one is blood pressure cuff. You'll hear that one. And with the blood that is pumping through what's called our circulatory system, I'm also able to test the blood. So on our blood, we have cell surface markers to determine what type of blood is it. So we need to know that so that if a patient is receiving blood or donating blood, we know exactly what to label it so we don't have a reaction from the immune system where it causes clumping in the blood and that causes a whole bunch of other problems. So here in this little sample, 
I tested a sample of blood against what's called antibodies. So those antibodies are going to tell us if the person has type A, type B, or if they are positive, negative for a RH factor. So if you see some, heard of someone who has O negative blood, then that means that they had no reaction at all. And so they are what's called the universal donor and anybody can receive their blood. For other people, we gotta make sure which type it is so we don't give it to the wrong person. So in this sample, when you test against the antibodies, so they're going to react to those cell surface markers. So we had clumping, so you can see the little dots. That's where the blood clumped up. So we had clumping in our A marker, no clumping in the B marker, and we had, uh-oh, clumping in the RH factor. So this is a positive for that RH factor. So you can see all the little clumps in there. So with our blood type, this person tested positive for A, and positive for the RH factor. So we would call them having a type A positive blood. So for that person, they'd have limited people that they can either give blood to or receive blood from. So, and, okay, so with my class, one thing that is very beneficial for being able to teach the class that I do is because I was a good reader. So I'm not scared of big words because I learned how to read off of a cereal box. And those are some big words at the end of a cereal box because there's all kinds of stuff in there. But it tastes good. Okay, so for when I started to learn what I needed to teach for this class, because remember my doctorate degree is brain science. So brain biology, fancy word, neurobiology. So I had to learn everything else. So what I use was reading skills in order to do so. So not only do I have to know the science stuff, and I can use that for class, but being able to read as well as go on stuff like YouTube, you can learn a lot. So I'm going to go to my textbook camera here. So here's the textbook again. So what I would do is flip it open, boom. I would read. If there was a word that I didn't know, for example, like here, or here, these are not good examples. Okay, like here, or aphasia, I can either go to the glossary and look it up, or just Google it, whatever, um, and be able to work with the word, break it apart so that I'm able to know what I'm talking about. I also can look at the pictures and learn from there. So that's one of the skills that I use, even though reading and writing are not typically seen as science skills. They're necessary for learning so that as you are testing your knowledge, which you can do using the questions at the end of the textbook. So that's one way of how I was making sure, do I understand this? And it also helped me because I was able to see whether or not my, see where there could be places where my students might stumble. And so I would help them uh, help make stuff for them so that they wouldn't have to stumble like I did as I was worth learning. So kind of going through the material and making sure that I could find places where they, um, they would find trouble or find difficult. So I could use the questions at the back of the book to make sure I knew what I was talking about. Also with testing your comprehension this section, so just ask a question. So I use English skills to write it out. So one way of knowing how well you know a topic is by the ability of you learn something and can you put it in your own words and that actually helps with uh, being able to know that you know the material material or the knowledge well enough because you can do it in your own words instead of having to copy word for word from the textbook let's see what else did i well, I can tell you. Okay, so for my actual career path, so not your first job may not necessarily be something that you're going to do for the rest of your life, but you can take skills from each job that you have and build on it as, hey, I learned these types of skills in this other job and it's helping me now for my current job. So each step that you make, you're able to build and be better. 
Another thing is sometimes some jobs you travel. So if I were at a big university and I had to do research, well, part of my duties would be to take what I learned in my research, so doing my science experiments, and I could travel to conferences and share that with other people. Now, I don't have to do that for my job because um, if I'm doing a conference, it'd be more for education, so I don't have to actually do as much traveling as I used to. But uh, it is going to be fun. You also can go some fun places. It's just, it's a lot of work doing the research, and I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be able to, in a stable job, just be able to teach and continue teaching, and so I can retire. That's my point. Because scientists, they have to do their experiments. They have to prove that they're right. Then they have to write it all up and then ask for more money and then repeat that until they retire. I didn't want to do that. I'd rather just be able to teach. So wherever your career path takes you, whether you start off where you want to be or you have to build your way up, as long as you take each one step by step and build toward where you want to go, figure out what you want to do, and uh, have the ability to earn the money to do so, or just do it also on the side. So some people, they might do one thing for to pay like their bills and pay rent or grocery shopping, and then they might do something fun on the side that they really like. So for example, I like writing. So I write on the side, but that's not for my main job. So you might be doing something that, you know, it's not everything that you want to do, but you might have something that you do for your main job, and then you have some fun on the side. So I hope this helps you out, and I will maybe see you in the future. Bye, y'all.